<clears throat> so uh, for those of you who've been with me through this journey, it's been Kyle's Easy Philosophy for the last two episodes, and I'm actually rebranding to Kyle's uh, Phenomenological Method uh, because of what I'm trying to accomplish with this uh, channel. And I think it'll help a lot more people this way, just because, and it makes it easier for me uh, where I can decide where I'd like to, or what I'd like to talk about and where I'd like to go with things. So um, this is Kyle's philosophical, I mean, Kyle's phenomenological method, episode three. All right, so I imagine people wonder what phenomenological method is. Oh, come on. So I should not put this here. Um, can you say something real quick? Hello. Oh, I didn't even switch. Okay, so I need that to be there. I'm gonna just put this over here. I'm gonna just go ahead and actually that's perfect. I don't know how I did that, but that's what I want. Uh <clears throat> sorry, technical difficulties. <clears throat> All right, so the phenomenological method. In its most basic form, phenomenolo phenomen phenomenolo I don't know, I've always had trouble saying this word. Phenomenology, that's what I'll just call it, and I'll just continue to run with that. But phenomenology attempts to create conditions for the objective study of topics usually regarded as subjective. Consciousness, uh, such as consciousness and the contents of conscious experience, such as judgments, perceptions and emotions. Uh, although phenomenal, phenomenology seems to be scientific, it does not attempt to study consciousness from the perspective of clinical psychology or neurology. Instead, it seeks through systematic reflection to determine the essential properties and structures of experience. All right, um, I think this is Edmund Husserl here. I'm not sure why I don't have anything for him, but uh, so for phenomenologists, there are several assumptions that help explain the foundations of phenomenology. Wow, why did it just switch back? Okay. Uh, so phenomenologists reject the concept of objective research. They prefer grouping assumptions through a process called the phenomenological epoche. And an epoche is an ancient Greek term in uh, Hellenistic philosophy. It is a technical term typically translated as a suspension of judgment, but also as withholding of assent. In uh, the modern philosophy of phenomenology, it refers to the process of setting aside assumptions and beliefs. So I like phenomenology because it's, it's pretty much just a conversation between two people or two or more people where we're looking at the same thing. And while I might see Let's, I wish I could find something, or I, I know I can explain this in a good way, but I wish I had like a picture to explain this a little better. I can draw a picture. Um, yeah, so I didn't do what I wanted to. <laughs> you just have red marks over all your pages. <laughs> I was just making mine. So let's say I make a number, or I try to make a number seven. Well, scribble's probably what it is. So let's say I try to make the number seven here. From this side, it would look like an L, but from this side, it would look like a number seven is the type of deal I'm trying to get at with the phenomenal phenomenological method where if you're standing oh yeah so i know it's just like a bunch of words but once you like explain it a little better it makes a lot more sense so that is going to make this entire conversation so much easier on my end so i have to imagine that for a lot of people thank you for sharing that analogy yeah 
So uh, the reason why you want to withhold or suspend your judgment is because while you may see a number seven, someone else may see an L and you don't know really who's wrong. So it doesn't make sense to say that your assumption is better than someone else's. It's better to just take everyone's assumption at the same time and create something out of that. Where I just can say like, instead of this is only a seven and it's what a seven will look like, I can say it could be a seven, it could be an L, but when you suspend the judgment, you know, you're not gonna say it's better being a seven or better being an L. Um, and that's uh, another way I'm trying to use this channel in a way that I might get something from this material that you may not, and you may get something that I may not. And between our conversation, we'll be able to create a better picture of what we're trying to talk about. Um, so number two, they believe that analyzing daily human behavior can provide one with a greater understanding of nature. And I think that's spot on, if you ask me. Like, you want to have, if nature is something that's going on constantly, you want to get a picture of it every day. You know, you don't want to just have, oh, well, this is what nature was like back in the day, but today it might be something different because we haven't really checked. Um, they assert that people should be explored. And this is because people can be understood through the unique ways they reflect the society they live in. So a good way to explain this point, the whole reason we're having this video and like it exists is because I believe that, or I, my society reflects onto me that knowledge is important and worth sharing. So if I didn't have that belief or, let me see how I put that. Uh, if society didn't reflect on me, I wouldn't be able to reflect on society or have, I wouldn't be able to explain society's reflection on me if it didn't reflect on me, because I wouldn't, it would have no effect on me. Um, so this is, I'm not exactly 100% for this point, just because I think that traditional data has its like uses and it's definitely useful. But phenomenologi phenomenologists prefer to gather CAPTA or conscious experience than uh, traditional data. So what would be a good way to put this? Instead of worrying about the stats, they're more worried about the playing of the game for uh, I guess basketball, for example, they're not worried about how many, what the stat line is going to be. They're worried about how they're going to interact during the game and like during all the movements of the game. Not just like why did they score this amount of points, but why did they make the decisions they made that led them to scoring those points? Exactly, exactly. Um, and they consider phenomenology to be uh, oriented towards discovery and therefore they research using methods that are far less restrictive than in other sciences. Uh, I think that's a good point. I know at least, and I bet a bunch of people would agree with me on this, that we would be a little bit further in science if we weren't so restrictive in the way that we acquire data and like make it useful. Uh, one way I'd say that we're not using, or not that we're not using, but one way science is being a little less restrictive would be with COVID uh, vaccines where every other vaccine has been tested. I don't even know how long. I'm not going to get into it because I'm not an expert on that. But this vaccine is definitely coming out with the quickness. And it hasn't necessarily been tested as well as other vaccines have. And hopefully, I hope there's no like bad side effects that happen to anyone. But I hope that it's just, it just seems that if it was a little more restrictive, I feel like people would feel a little more confident in getting the vaccine. Uh, and that might be a way to be a phenomenology where, well, they aren't as restrictive. So how can I say that their results are going to be the same as mine? Because they didn't have the same method, you know, kind of deal like that. Um, an important element of phenomenology that Husserl borrowed from uh, Brentano is intentionality often described as aboutness and the notion that consciousness is always consciousness of something. I think that's a pretty big statement. Uh, 
intentionality definitely something to consider and think about like even thinking about intentionality you have to be intentional in that thinking so it's something that we are constantly about and like it's something we can't really escape kind of like consciousness but i can't imagine what it would be like to be conscious of nothing would you just be dead i feel like that's what would happen because dead people aren't conscious of shit i mean of nothing <laughs> Uh, so, so is the con yeah like is the consciousness of nothing the same as the absence of consciousness? I think so, because if you're conscious of nothing, then what are you really conscious of? If consciousness is aboutness and intentionality, like if your intention is nothing, then you're nothing, pretty much. So where does sleep and dreaming fall in that? That's a good question. I think, well, at least my answer for that would be you're conscious of your dreams. Like, you know, you can sometimes remember your dreams. I feel like you're always conscious of them. It's just your memory doesn't always work with you to remember the things that happen. I think that could also be associated with how we consider our dreams to not be real. So we wouldn't like want to keep that information because it would never help us in the real world. <laughs> Um, the object of consciousness is called the intentional object and this object is constituted for consciousness in many different ways through, for instance, perception, memory, retention, and protention, uh, retention and protention and signification. So pretty much what this is trying to say is, well, the intentional object uh, could be explained in many different ways, such as perception and retention, all that other stuff. Um, so though many of the phenomenological methods involve various reductions, phenomenology is, in essence, anti-reductionistic. Uh, the reductions are mere tools to better understand and describe the workings of consciousness not to reduce any phenomenon to these descriptions. So the ultimate goal of these reductions is to understand how these different aspects are constituted into the actual thing as experienced by the person experiencing it. So I think what they're trying to say here is that the mind can't be reduced to anything or consciousness can't be reduced to anything. It can't be reduced to the mind. It can't be reduced to the body. It can't be reduced to the soul. It just is. And any reductions that we do are simply ways to better understand consciousness as we experience it. But no reduction is a true reduction to, well, consciousness can be reduced to this and this, which uh, I'll just wait to get to that after we get to biological naturalism. All right, so this is one of the larger slides I have. This is about Martin Heidegger. This is a guy over here. Um, <laughs> Heidegger, uh, he modified he's cute. <laughs> he's a cute guy. I mean, I wish my hair slicked back like that. Uh, he modified Husserl's conception of phenomenology because what Heidegger perceived as Husserl's, oh, he modified them because of what Heidegger perceived as Husserl's subjective tendencies where Husserl convinced humans as having been, or conceived humans as having been constitu constituted by states of consciousness, Heidegger countered that consciousness. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and read that over because that, it's a lot of like big words. I was yeah. kind of stuttering through it. Cut, print, check the gate. Absolutely. Moving on. So Heidegger modified Husserl's conception of phenomenology uh, because of what Heidegger did as Husserl's subjective tendencies. Uh, Husserl conceived humans as being constituted by states of consciousness, and Heidegger countered that consciousness is peripheral to the primacy of one's existence, the mode of being Dasein. And I think Dasein is like a human, like 
the experience of being human. And this cannot be reduced to one's consciousness of it. From this angle, one state of mind is an effect rather than a determinant of existence, including those aspects of existence of which one is not conscious. So when I think of this, I consider the Heidegger uh, Husserl distinction as like you can be conscious of something and still be human, but you can you're still human when you're dead and you're not conscious of anything. It's not like you aren't human anymore. And I think that's what Heidegger's trying to get at here. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that, or do you think that once you're dead, you're no longer human? You're just I mean, who knows what you would? Uh, <clears throat> I think that that's like partly why like cultures of our past have really focused on the like the way that they bury their dignified <clears throat> humans to ensure that like because it's like well are you like just in that body eternally and like you have like so if you get put in a casket like is there are you able to regain consciousness if once you've lost it and you've died and they but my so my belief i i try to f believe that like consciousness is a singular experience but it's like it's it's the same energy experiencing different human experiences but that that consciousness and that energy that consciousness the spirit can and has existed in things other than this human form and that's like it's the reason for things like the collective unconscious and the way that even though we're all individuals, like human, we all play the same game and we've been playing the same game with each other for a really long time. Yeah. Um, so if I'm correct and like what I'm hearing, you're on, um, you think that uh, consciousness is in like, I wanna say it's idealist where you think it's all mental or do you think that there's a physical capacity as well to consciousness? Because I don't know. I like the idealist theory, but it's hard to explain how the mind can create. Well, <clears throat> I just thinking of like my, I can only really think of my own experience as a human. Yeah. And, and I know that your, my own consciousness is never the same. And there's times where like, where I would say that I have been extremely sucked within myself to where my consciousness appeared like as though you had not a virtual reality because not a virtual reality screen because it wasn't that realistic but it seemed like there is a tube television just as close to your eye as close to your eyes as it could get but it was clear that it wasn't what you were seeing it's like it, it seemed like you were clearly watching something happening not experiencing something and you feel that real disconnect from your body. But then there's other times where you just feel supremely connected to the body. Um, getting hit, like losing consciousness, getting knocked out, getting concussion, that changes your consciousness. It like the, the, internal, exp the internal experience of consciousness is like a, it's like a wave is how I've experienced it. It's just like there's different ends of the spectrum that I that it can be at, at any point as far as the connected to the physical world versus the connected to a mental world. Yeah. So that's how I see it. It's like it's not it's like those two physical and mental are opposite ends of a spectrum. But if you take that spectrum and turn it vertically, you exist as a point. At any point, making like a sine wave. I understand. Uh, so when you said that, I was thinking, uh, so for the point on the wave, I guess, where it'd be like, I can just draw it here. So let's say this is conscious or this is mental and then this is physical, I believe, or at least what you were thinking, when you were saying that, what I thought was. Yeah. Um, maybe right here. Now 
Now, I don't know if the people watching this can see because I can't see on my screen because where you appear He's as like, like a video, it's blocking where you're drawing. Okay, well, I'm, I'll just make a new slide. I'm actually pretty good with this <laughs> little thing here. Uh, I'm gonna delete that. Oops, I think that's the power button. Oh, are we still are we still on? <laughs> it's not my this is good, bro. All right. Uh, so here's that. Here's that, and then you're saying. Then can you put like labels like in words so that way, like it's very like I. I'm watching this, and I like I can tell that you you understand what I'm saying, but to make it visual for the audience, maybe. Yeah, bro. That's so it's like, what what is that thing that moves between? Like, is that dot a spirit? Is that dot, like, what is that? And uh, we can probably just, oh, well, let me see what the rest of this is because that's what the next part of this uh, presentation is all about is what nice. can that die. Right. Let's hear it. Let me see. So I'm I'm just gonna go ahead and finish on Heidegger real quick, because I feel like this last part is kind of important as well. But by shifting the center of gravity from consciousness, psychology to existence, ontology, Heidegger onto uh, Heidegger altered the subsequent direction of phenomenology. And as a consequence of this modification, uh, phenomenology became increasingly relevant to psychoanalysis, where Husserl gave priority to a depiction of consciousness that was fundamentally alien to psychoanalytic conceptions of the unconscious. Heidegger offered a way to conceptualize experience that could accommodate those aspects of one's existence that lie in the periphery of sentient awareness. So um, that's a lot of stuff to really be saying. And my big, uh, the big point I got from this was that Heidegger switched the uh, focus from consciousness to existence. And I think that's a big uh, jump because, you know, obviously like your psychology can only affect so much, but when you take existence into account, you, you're affecting like, what your body does, how you feel, what you feel from the world, what you give into the world, and how those things interact. And I think that just like increases the scope of phenomenology so much. And that's why I'd like to change the, uh, that's why I'm changing the name of my show to Kyle's Phenomenological Method because that'll give me the ability to go off onto, let's say, I don't really want to get too political with this, but I could bring up different things and like how it affects people and like what that means for it to affect people. And I think that's something that I think a lot of people would benefit from. But, uh, so phenomenology, uh, I structured this episode in a way that we go from phenomenology where we understand, oh, we can uh, study existence to a study of existence, which would be biological naturalism. And uh, biological naturalism is a theory about, among other things, the relationship between consciousness and the body. Uh, and we're considering the body, the brain, and hence an approach to the mind-body problem. It was first proposed by the philosopher John Searle in 1980, and it's defined by two main theses. All mental phenomena, from pains, tickles, and itches, to the most abstruse thoughts, are caused by lower level neurobiological processes in the brain and mental phenomena are higher level features of the brain. So when I hear biological naturalism, what I think of is, I guess a good way to explain it to you because you've played football would be like, you know how when you're part of a football team, like you represent that team? Like in the- Collective yeah. unconscious like a collective unconscious pretty much. And that's what he sees it as, is all the neurons in your brain firing uh, create the experience of uh, consciousness instead of consciousness being a completely separate deal from our body, it originates from our body. 
Yeah, I can. I believe that shit. Um, I just watched the uh, National Geographic documentary Free Solo about Alex Arnold, who this guy rock climbs huge mountains without any ropes, and just by himself. Why? And <laughs> I, I I don't know. It's crazy, bro. But you think not? To, but those elite level. Um, like suffrage athletes, like marathon athletes, skiers, um, bot, uh, like power lifters, these guys that lift insane amount of weights and like literally their bones break under the weight kind of thing. That there's way we, I think like even with like humans understand that and we use that to our advantage or if we choose to in ways. So like, I think that that's like, that's facts, you know? Yeah, I understand. Uh, so one question I have and in relation to that rock climber guy you were talking about, do you think that it's his conscious choice to make that? Or if it's just from originating from the body and it's all the neurons in it? <laughs> <laughs> like, is that, is he in the chair? <laughs> That's something that just happens and he has no power over it. I think that um, it depends on where you are on that dot or on that wave because each of us has that animal side of us, the things that you were just drawn to that you do like if you have nothing to do like a lot of us learn those and some we learn some of us learn that we're very lazy animals but when you're locked in a space and you don't have anything outside of that space that you have up that you're able to do what things do you crave what thing what activities do you work into your life and i think those are those animalistic um, like maybe more physical, like the physical is attached to the human, human body is a biological animal, you know, so maybe that animal side, but the mental side is more like the no, we are this, we are society, we are graduate students, we are athletes, we are citizens, we are Democrats, we are Muslim, whatever it may be. Yeah, I, I don't know. Because I want to say, at least it's easier to say that I make my own choices. But if what he's saying is right, then I'm subject to like the laws of physics. And by definition of like a law and what it is, I don't get to, my movements are restricted by them. So I have to live within this certain framework where it's, oh, I can't do this. I can't do that. Instead of well, in my mind, I'm free to do what I'd like. I don't know. It, I don't know. What is something that you have something that you have tried to stop doing, or try like have you ever like tried to make yourself start waking up at four a.m. and go for a run, or or try to stop smoking or anything like that? Yeah. And it's like you try you try really hard to make yourself do it, but you it doesn't take long until you're like, no, I'm not doing this. Like, this is not, this is not how Kyle operates. This is not how a Naaman operates. We operate like this and you sneak back. You're like, you relapse or whatever, you know? Yeah. I wonder with that said, we're like, obviously our habits are something that we've learned is our ability to question our habits something that we've learned as well? Or is that something that, I guess that's kind of what, uh, that's the intentionality of phenomenology was talking about where like, if I'm conscious, I'm conscious of something. Or if I have a routine, it's a routine of doing something instead of just a routine. I don't know if that was the good, I don't know if that was a good explanation of what the point I'm trying to make is, but. Say that again? Yeah. I'm going to try, I'm not, I might not say the exact same thing, but I'm going to try to like explain my point a little better. Gotcha. In terms of uh, like a habit, do I really have the power to say no to my body on what that habit entails or is it something that's out of my control? 
and it would just my efforts are futile regardless. And a lot of people, at least in the self help area, say that like you can change that, but if it's really just stuff in your brain, I mean, I guess you could because you can take psychoactive drugs that'll make it so you can't reach the potential or the threshold to activate your uh, excitation processes. But I don't, I mean, I guess there's a lot of uh, support for biological naturalism, especially with psychoanalysis and stuff like that, where it's like, well, if I give you this drug, you're not gonna be able to get mad because of your neurons and your brain won't be able to uh, get the potassium it needs or whatever to create an extra potential that would make you want to be aggressive or whatever. So I can see how this is like a really good view. And that's why I chose it because like monism, it seems too simple where, oh, everything's mm -hmm. or everything's good. I'm, I'm a materialism, not monism. But materialism is a little too simple. Where so what about, what about like schizophrenia or even just common depression, anxiety? bipolar disorder like things like that that are shifts i assume like if it's shifts in your mental state that has to be shifts in your consciousness too yeah I, you're saying like um, so can those things be corrected we like i mean like are, are those choices i guess Ooh. Huh. i'd like to say they're choices but our choices are kind of depending on like what we were raised to believe is right. And, you know, if you believe, um, one good example of this is the four minute mile where everyone believed that it was impossible to happen until it happened. And then now everyone's trying to do miles in like three or however long it is. You know, you understand what I'm talking about though, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a good example. Four minute mile or not, but it just seems that once you like do something, it's done and it can't be like taken back. So once someone ran the four minute mile, it was impossible for people to like conceptualize that it was impossible to happen anymore. And I don't know if that can even even more household for people who don't run four minute miles. A hundred years ago, people like would pay more than a house to get a horse. Yeah. And then when cars started becoming popular, it's like, well, you must be like this class to have a car. But now it's like, well, you pretty much you if as a grown adult in, in this gen, in this year, this society, it's very difficult to do successful things if you don't have a car. So it's like that's so it's so. I want to say progress would be a word but i don't even know if that's the right word to use because it's so subjective but i mean that's the whole deal of phenomenology where it's your subjective truths have meaning and combining those together can create a better truth than what it was before and that's why I, that's honestly why i love talking about this shit because even, even if you have no idea what i'm talking about you're saying that helps me learn how to be better at it and like understand it more because then I'd have to explain it to you in a different way than what I'm normally doing it. And um, I, that's that's why this stuff matters, if you ask me. Because like obviously, yeah, like biological naturalism isn't going to get you any more money. Like you're not going to make a thousand dollars conversing about biological naturalism. But having that knowledge affects like your knowledge base, and it allows you to connect different things with different other things that you already know. And that's, uh, I think it was called the dialectic where it was, I'm gonna look that up real quick. I think you can still see my screen. Oh wait, I'm already on the internet. Please go away. That's why it's important to talk that people talk. Yeah. Um, Jordan Peterson says that silence leads to tyranny because um, I use this example with uh, those like people that, that I'm around a lot. It's like, well, if you don't tell me about that you have a boundary, 
my nature is to keep put because humans look for boundaries. We, we like to operate in boundaries, but yeah. we also like to explore. So if we explore and we don't see that this is a boundary, we continue to push. So in the, like in as small as example as like in a relationship, if you keep pushing and your significant other doesn't tell you that you've qu- crossed a boundary, then that person, while they are becoming a victim of your actions, their negligence led to you becoming their tyrant. And it's, it wasn't even necessarily like that could have been the furthest thing from your intentions. You could have had very good intentions for that relationship, but that lack of that, that lapse in communication didn't lead to the progression. Uh, yeah. And I, I have a good example for that too. Uh, and uh, it starts with my new job where it's, yeah, I could work 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. every day. And that could be what my job is. And if I get paid well enough, that's what it would be. But if I don't speak up and say, hey, I don't want to do that, then they're not going to think that that's a problem. And for me, that's a problem because I don't like waking or I don't like being awake at those times of day. And I don't want to be stuck working somewhere doing that during those times of day where I could be asleep. So if I don't like actively tell them like, hey, I don't want to do this. And if you tell me to do it, I'm not going to, then it's on me. It's I'm actively, what would I say? Actively kind of helping them be a tyrant to me through not saying that, hey, I'm not cool with this, by not setting that boundary. Um, When you were talking about boundaries though, it made me think of, I can't remember who thought of it, but the basic idea is once you reach the boundary, you're no longer bound by it because you know it exists. And if it wouldn't feel like a boundary- Since it exists or something beyond. Yeah, since like, since you can experience it as a boundary, you have to understand that it's uh, it's keeping you inside and that because you feel it as a boundary, it is not a boundary because you know that you're beyond it or else it wouldn't feel like it was a boundary to you. Um, all right, so I found the dialectic page, but there's a lot of stuff and I don't really think I can explain it like that. So I'm gonna just give a little wishy-washy explanation. So the dialectic is pretty much, let me pull this out. I'm gonna just use this as my fucking scratch board. If I have one idea over here and I have another idea over here, I can combine these two ideas into a new idea kind of a pain in the ass doing it like this. <laughs> but then this new idea becomes the first part of another idea and it just continues on and on. Yeah. So can you, like, uh, I'm following the graph. Can you explain, like, what was the context of that? Um, we were talking about the dialectic. Let me find out where I was. I don't even remember what we were talking about it, to be honest, or like what it was in reference to, but, oh, I think it was in reference to the uh, phenomenological method, because I think that borders on here pretty good, where this could be idea one. Uh, can you still hear me? Yes, sir. All right. 
right. Well, I'm going to continue on uh, with Cyril. So Cyril denies dualism, the idea that the mind is a separate kind of substance from the body, as this contradicts our entire understanding of physics. Uh, he does not bring God into the problem, and he denies any type of dualism, claiming that the distinction is a mistake. And he rejects these ideas because, uh, one, the mind is not objectively viewable and does not fall under the rubric of physics. And two, he believes that consciousness is both a cause of events in the body and a response to events in the body. Uh, so he believes that consciousness is a real part of the real world and cannot be Reduce pretty much anything else. Uh, whether that's something as a state of mind or a computer program, he contends, for example, that the software known as Deep Blue knows nothing about chess. So I'm gonna have to explain that one a little bit. So Deep Blue is a pretty much chess simulator, and I'm pretty sure it beat like a world chess player at least once, like the champion chess player at least once. And Cyril here is trying to say that. Uh, Deep Blue knows nothing. It only acts on what it's been, like, the uh, program that it's running on. Yeah, so that's pretty much it. He doesn't think that humans can really know anything, which I don't know. Like, because how can I say that and then still at the same time hold a conversation with you and claim that it's going to mean something? You know what I mean? Like, if I can't know anything, then nothing really means anything. Because it's all based on pretty much what my neurons in my brain do, not based on like what I consciously think. And I think that uh, goes against like the self-help kind of area where they say, well, if you think positive thoughts, this is what will happen. But uh, Cyril's saying with biological naturalism, whatever happens kind of just happens and you have no control over it because you don't really know and you have no capacity to know. I just feel like, I feel like that's one of the things that makes it so it's hard to believe in biological naturalism, because if I believe that, then how can I, like, where does, where do words exist in my neurons, you know, where do words exist in my brain? Where are memories? Yeah, like, there's just too much stuff that <clears throat> you can't say that, oh, it's a neuron firing in my brain that caused that, or I mean, I guess you could say that. And I guess a good reason to say that would be, well, we just don't have the technology to like know what exactly part of the brain makes that happen. Maybe the way we're looking at it could be completely different. You know, maybe brain science will look at things completely different in 50 years than what it is now. And then we'll have a better understanding. But at least for now with what we know, with the knowledge presented, I had to say that I don't think that's right. Uh, so, I put this here in case you didn't understand or if anyone in the audience doesn't understand what dualism is. So, for dualism, uh, physical and mental substances are either, okay, that's the key, sorry about that. Uh, matter and mind are completely separate, uh, but for monism, either you're either physicalist where you believe that it's matter, uh, matter is more important than the mind. You're an idealist where you think that the mind is more important than matter, or you can be a neutral monist, which I think that's what we were getting at earlier with the waves where the dot would be the third substance. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, so we'll move on from there. Yeah, I would say that's, that is the same data shown on a different graph we showed it on a line graph they showed it as a pie chart well i'm i'm glad and i hope that helps someone else understand it because it's not easy putting these things together <laughs> Man, but, that's what's up bro uh, so this entails that the brain has the right causal powers to produce intentionality or consciousness uh, but he's careful to point out that while it appears to be the case that certain brain functions are sufficient for producing conscious states, our current state of knowledge prevents us from concluding that they are necessary for producing consciousness. So a uh, quote from him, a uh, quote from Cyril, Cyril, 
The fact that brain processes can cause consciousness does not imply that only brains can be conscious. The brain is a biological machine and we might build an artificial machine that was conscious just as the heart is a machine and we have built artificial hearts. But because we do not know exactly how the brain does it, we are not yet in a position to know how to do it artificially. I think that's at least, that definitely earns him some points for the believability where, well, we just don't know. And obviously he's hoping on, he's banking on future scientific advancements on explaining his uh, view a little better. Uh, Cyril treats consciousness as a state of the brain. Uh, so this is where I was talking about the football team analogy. The uh, causal interaction of the mind and brain can be thus described in naturalistic terms where events at the micro level, perhaps that of individual neurons cause consciousness and changes at the macro level, the whole brain constitute consciousness. Uh, micro level changes or micro changes cause and then are impacted by holistic changes in much the same way that individual football players cause a team as a whole to win games, causing the individuals to gain confidence from the knowledge that they are part of a winning team. Um, I, I kind of want to explain that a little better because I feel like I didn't do a very good job with this uh, note here. I'm trying to think of like something where all the parts come together to make a whole. I mean, I guess you could say that as like the brain where the hypothalamus and the amygdala come together and that uh, creates our conscious experience of this. But we don't, I know you can like have damage to those positions and still have that, which a, I mean. <clears throat> a Navy ship. There's anywhere from anywhere from 50 to 700 to 2000 i think like the biggest aircraft carriers have um like 9000 that's more than what my home city is population was and even those large populations each member is on that ship for a very specific reason even if it's a very simple reason like hey your job this person's job is to make sure there's no dust on the, in this hallway each part, like it's like Pirates of the Caribbean movies, the part of the crew, part of the ship, part of the crew, part of the ship. <laughs> and uh, so if each, if each, if any member falls out, the other parts have to compensate. So example on a watch rotation, say you have five people standing, um, four watch stations. So one person gets to rest at a time, but this person gets injured, gets sick, or disappears. So now there's only one, two, three, four people to fill four watch stations. So now none of them get breaks. And then that's going to cause this guy to get extremely overworked. He's going to fail. So now you, you don't even have enough members to account for the entire positions that are needed. And so the system starts to fail. Yeah, I think that's actually a pretty good explanation of the point I'm trying to make. Like all the individual parts lead to, like all the people doing a specific job lead to the completion of a bigger job, which we could say uh, for our neurons acting uh, like this, it leads to consciousness in our main experience. Yeah, which tying it to your football example, like like my, my thoughts, like, um, in high school, I was a real selfish player, even in college. And that's why, like, I didn't, I didn't really like college ball that much because it didn't matter if my team won. If I felt like I didn't win, if I felt like I didn't play good, then I considered it a bad game. Yeah. And I, and the same, like, the team could lose, and while I wouldn't be happy that the team lost, if I had six sacks in that game, I'd be like, well, all right, but. I did everything that I could, you know, <laughs> like there's nothing more that I could have contributed. Fuck yeah, bro. Uh, yeah, that's a great, uh, another great way to explain that point too, where an uh, individual might do good, but if the whole team does bad, then 
it considers like the whole team as a whole does bad. So if you're on that team, you're doing bad as well. Uh, he articulates this distinction by pointing out that the common philosophical term reducible is ambiguous. He contends that consciousness is causally reducible to brain processes without being ontologically reducible. Uh, he hopes that making this distinction will allow him to escape the traditional dilemma between reductive physicalism and substance dualism. Uh, he affirms the essentially physical nature of the universe by asserting that consciousness is completely caused by and realized in the brain, but also doesn't deny what he takes to be the obvious facts that humans are really conscious and that conscious states have an essential, I have an essentially first person nature. Shit's complicated as fuck. Um, so uh, I try to explain reductive materialism on this next slide where uh, type physicalism, also known as reductive materialism, type identity theory, mind brain identity theory, and identity theory of mind is a physicalist theory in the philosophy of mind. It asserts that mental events can be grouped into types and then can be correlated with types of physical events in the brain. For example, one mental, uh, one type of mental event such as mental pains will presumably turn out to be describing one type of physical event like C fibers firing. So let me see if I can do a decent example for this. Okay, let's say this guy just, I'll give him a peg leg, I guess. <laughs> let's say he just got his oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what the fuck? Whatever, fuck this thing. So let's just say this guy's in pain, all right? <laughs> Uh, they're saying that the pain can be grouped into a type of phenomena, and then that phenomena can be then associated with a type of brain process. Uh, uh, but uh, argument against type uh, or identity theory, which I guess identity theory is probably the best way to explain it because you can say that pain can be identified as, let's say C fibers firing in your brain. Uh, the multiple realizability thesis asserts that uh, mental states can be realized in multiple kinds of systems, not just brains. For example, since the identity theory identifies mental events with certain brain states, it does not allow for mental states to be realized in organisms or computational systems that do not have a brain. This is, in effect, an argument that the identity theory is identity theory is too narrow because it does not allow for organisms without brains to have mental states. Uh, however, token identity, where only particular tokens of mental states are identical with particular tokens of physical events, and functionalism, both account for multiple realizability. Uh, I don't think we needed that last part. So. Pretty much the whole idea of multiple realizability is brain states can be uh, realized in different ways than just the way the brain like shows them. Can you be conscious without your brain? Uh, for this guy, no, because everything originates from your brain. Other people, so, sorry. What about like single celled organisms and lower level animals that like don't have brains or barely have anything, but they have functions that they carry out? Like, is that 
a level of consciousness at all or is that something completely different that's a good question so you're thinking of like an amoeba like just a single cell organism yeah that amoeba knows to do something even yeah. if it's a very simple thing and your question is if, if it's uh, conscious of that uh movement pretty much like if it's making mm -hmm. that choice mm -hmm. I want to say that they can't be conscious without, or at least the way this guy explains it, you have to have a brain in order to be conscious. Yeah. So if you don't have that, making all the parts of a, like all the single parts of a brain, you can't be conscious. Of cannot. My question for him would be like, if someone like loses part of their brain, are they no longer fully conscious or? Oh, oh fuck, I need to look up this guy's name. Um... Phineas Gage, that's what it is. Phineas Gage. Um, yeah. I learned about him in high school anatomy. F Phineas Gage worked on the la on the railroad and an old yeah. like a yeah, bro. This this was the first noted example of somebody losing a piece of his physical the anatomy of his brain and therefore altering the person that he was completely changing the person that he was but did not cause him to die but he was very much conscious um uh, in short though a dynamite shoved down a like nine like a deep hole with a rod like you can see in the in the skull picture, the rod was down on top of the dynamite and there was supposed to be a cap on top of the rod that prevented the rod from shooting out when the dynamite went off. So it made the blast go down, yeah. but there was no cap. As soon as he dropped down the pipe, the dynamite went off and it sent that rod up under his orbit at the top, like just above the top of his like. I think that's like maybe like your maxillary bone, which is the eye, the bone just beneath your eye bone up behind his eye. It missed his optic nerve so he could still see. And he was conscious while this happened. They found him in a complete conscious state. I, be I, I believe. And they wrote a whole book about it. Yeah, let me let me see if I can give a little bit more of a explanation say all the shit here uh was perhaps the first case to suggest the brain's role in determining personality and that damage to specific parts of the brain might induce specific mental changes so this uh phineas gage is actually uh i think this would be pro uh biological naturalism because it shows that when you damage a specific part of your brain it induces a specific mental change now the question is if it's repeatable, if someone else were to get that shit shot up their face like that, would they still, would they be a different person or would they still be the same, you know? And obviously we can't test that. I'd rather we don't test that. <laughs> and there's levels to it, like CTE changes the brain, like changes personalities, changes your, the organism, but you can't, currently we cannot detect CTE until post-mortem during an autopsy. There's no other way to detect it. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess if with CTE, it would affect your brain. So I guess people who would really know you would notice something was different under biological naturalism, or at least that's what it seems. Yeah, somebody would notice, but I don't think you would notice. You wouldn't. Lil Wayne said, you don't know what you're doing, so you stop doing it. So call me clueless, because I do this. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that's a good point. Uh, I'm trying to think. I have some notes on my phone. I think would go really, would really be good for right now, for what you just said about Lil Wayne. Uh, pretty much to just keep the conversation going. Something along the lines of once you start like, when you're doing something and you start critiquing yourself, you're no longer doing the object anymore. So your performance starts to drop. 
and it's not because of the critique it's because you're no longer fully focused on what you're doing and i think that goes with what Lil wayne was saying where you don't know what you're doing until you're done and once you once you <laughs> you know what you're doing but you're critiquing it and you're judging <laughs> it. <laughs> it's like it's like well it's did it's did uh, i wish i i don't know but that's a great great thing to say man. and i think that's really important for people to hear where once you start critiquing yourself and start thinking about uh one way i put it is you've ever heard of flow before flow yeah where like guess, flow state yeah where challenge meets uh potential or whatever i've heard of it but uh can you explain like keep 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 explaining yeah all right so i'll just use this over here what is that? <laughs> <laughs> That's a guy. But uh, <laughs> like this. P-H-Y-S-I-C-A-L-A-B-I-L-I-T-R. Physical ability. So let's say your physical ability, you're only this good at playing tennis. I don't know why it doesn't save sometimes. Or so I can only, I can jump this high. You can only jump this high. But let's say the bar is over here or the challenge. I don't know if I would want it to put it over here. Yeah, I should probably switch these, but I'm gonna try and go ahead and explain it like this, just cause. That's all right. Um, let's say right here is where the maximum amount of like energy and everything you do. Like, let's say this is the point where that's how good you'll be. Now let's say you're here and that's where the challenge is at. You're not gonna be able to do that because you're not gonna have the physical ability to complete the task. Mm, I see what you mean. I see what you mean. So like the units, like if you made that a bar graph instead of a line graph. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Um, you, like you could see like, well, where the first lines are, it may be five units of energy for physical ability is where the first line is, but it may be eight units of energy for the challenge and that's your sweet spot. But in the bottom, it's 10 uh, energies of, or 10 units of energy for the challenge, but your sweet spot for physical, physical ability only lines up with eight, then you are beyond, like you can see that you're beyond your ability to perform. Yeah. And, um, so when you're in a state of flow, they say that like you, uh, you don't really feel like yourself, you're just doing it just to do it. And once you start critiquing yourself or how Lil Wayne was saying, once you're done doing it, <laughs> uh you're no longer like in that state of flow so you're no longer doing the maximum amount of stuff you could do if you if that makes sense i don't know if i brought that back together as well as i'd like to but I'm trying to do a bar graph maybe that'll help a little better so there's that Hopefully this will show through. I don't know if it's going to be like, okay, that's cool. Okay. Hopefully this will all move together. Oh, uh, no.
Would you would you put physical ability on the bottom or would you put uh challenge over here? So I the way I see it right now, um I would say challenge should be the bar on the right. Physical ability should would should be the bar on the left. Yeah, and see. then like flow would be a line that that horizontally so so on the y axis a line from the y axis that fits both of those um graphs or is your ideal which would then make the graphs even so you're saying this should be a challenge right mm -hmm. I'll just go ahead and make this thicker. There we go. And this is your. So then maybe have a a third bar graph that is your performance. So over here? Or not, uh, all the way to the right. So next to challenge, have performance. Because the, and then like you, so then like on the Y axis would be, I guess like your outcome. So like as, as your physical ability increases or decreases and your challenge increases or decreases, your performance will also increase or decrease. Oh, okay. And then um, I mean, we can explain it like this. So let's just put it like yeah. that. So when your physical ability meets your challenge, then your performance is high as, as hell. But when your challenge is way bigger than your physical ability, performance is low or and your physical ability is higher than your challenge you also have low performance because you're not doing as much as you possibly could but when those things meet then your performance is perfect or at, at least as perfect as it'll get right because there are i think that there are limits to like if we are if we belong to biology biology like you said earlier is subject to physics so um there's limits to physics. I'm gonna just go ahead and I want this here. And then because those are even, I want this one high. All right. That's a sweet spot. Like like the stereo when you're adjusting all the volume knobs and then it sounds just right. I know. <laughs> I hope everyone else can understand that. If you can't, please uh, comment, use the comment section and let us know. I will try my best to explain it better if no one understands it. Um, so we're here. I also have a video of him real quick that I'd like to discuss, but this is the last official slide. It can be tempting to see the theory of biological naturalism as a kind of property dualism, since in Cyril's view, the person's mental properties are categorically different from his or her micro physical properties. The latter have third person ontology, whereas the former only have first person ontology. So I think we should explain that. Let's just try and give a definition for ontology real quick. A uh, branch of science, uh, philosophy that studies concepts such as existence, being, becoming, and reality includes questions of how entities are grouped into basic categories and which of these ex entities exist on the most fundamental level. Ontology is traditionally listed as a part of the major branch of philosophy known as metaphysics. So I'll just keep that open. So for third person ontology, third person being, being microphysical properties. I think the way they're trying to explain this is that the third person ontology would be like how the first person ontology would be like if you experience how your neurons fire but third person ontology would be like you experiencing the reaction or the 
uh, not the cause, but the effect of your neurons firing. Well, first person ontology would be uh, pretty much you experience your neurons firing. So I think that actually Cyril's view is more aligned with first person ontology than third person because there'd be nothing else to experience the uh, third person under his view because we're all just neurons firing in our brain. While third person ontology would be more correctly aligned with property dualism because you can experience it, experience the effects of your body from your mind because your mind and body are separate. Um, So he's saying that microstructure is accessible objectively by any number of people as when several brain surgeons expect, inspect a patient's uh, brain pretty much, but pain or desire or belief are accessible only subjectively by the person who is experiencing them and no one else can access that mode. Uh, however, seal holds mental properties to be a species of physical property ones with first person ontology. So yeah, I was right. Uh, so this sets his view apart from dualism or physical, from a dualism of physical and non-physical properties because his properties are punitively physical. So pretty much he's saying that like, it's not, there's no separate entity for the brain or for the mind than the brain. Now, this is something new I'm trying. I've never had a video in one of my videos before, so I'm not really sure how this is going to play out, but uh, I'm just going to go ahead and shoot and see what happens. John, consciousness seems like the most yes. in the world. We all know what it is. We all have it. But why is it so mysterious? Well, there are several reasons. Um, I guess uh, the most important is that we have a certain conception of reality that's largely derived from the progress of the sciences over the past three centuries. And we think that ultimately reality must be material. And then we find, my gosh, we're all conscious. We all have this inner qualitative subjective stuff and that seems mysterious. And then I've, uh, another thing that makes it seem mysterious is we have this a terrific uh, religious philosophical tradition that says, reality divides into two. There's the mind and the body. There's the soul and the flesh. I, 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 and this makes it seem like, well, there must be these two different realms. And then we got another hassle. We can't see how, how are we gonna reduce uh, consciousness in the way that we reduced all the other things. Material objects reduced to molecules, colors reduced to light reflectances. But consciousness, if it's qualitative and subjective and it only exists when it's felt, then how do you do a reduction of that? Materialism says in, at bottom, consciousness doesn't really exist. It's an illusion. Uh, everything is material, third person. And that's obviously false because we know it from each of our own cases, from our own experience that consciousness exists. Now, dualism, which says, no, they're two separate and distinct realms. Uh, dualism is in worse shape in a way than materialism because it hardly gets up to the level of being false. It's incoherent. So I've suggested, look, forget about dualism, forget about materialism, and there's a way out of this conundrum. All right, help me. Where, okay, where's here's how it goes. Start off with what you know for a fact. Now, you know for a fact that you're conscious. Consciousness is real and irreducible. You can't get rid of it. Now, the second thing to remember, and this we've only come to know in the past couple centuries, all of my conscious states and all of your conscious states are caused by neuronal processes in the brain. And then third, consciousness is something that goes on in the brain. It is a feature or state or process going on in the brain. It's not mysterious. It is spatially localized. And finally, we know that uh, conscious states actually function causally. So if you take those four, it's real and irreducible, caused by brain processes, exists in the brain and functions causally. Then the problem is not to have a puzzle about consciousness, but to show what was mistaken about these other views. The key to this whole approach that I'm urging is we have to think of consciousness as a biological phenomenon. It's as much a part of human and animal biology as digestion or photosynthesis or the secretion of bile or mice. Yeah. Talking about human biology, human and animal biology, 
the, the main difference, at least at our present state of knowledge, is we have a better understanding of digestion than we do of consciousness. The brain is a tough nut to crack. Oh, man, that opened up a cookie jar that I could. I've heard so many different minds describe that phenomenon. And one of those, which is my favorite, is the idea of like, it is like a biological response. And the, we, the reason that it is the way it is, that we know it, other animals can potentially reach it. Like potentially, I've, I believe that velociraptors, if dinosaurs had not went extinct, from what I understand, like velociraptors level of consciousness to be, they would be like the what evolved like humans would be like lizard people now yeah. instead of monkey people because or the human equivalent would be lizard people instead of monkey people because it had to do with like their 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 like it's nutrition it's feeding the mind and velociraptors were so good at hunting and they just had such an abundance of everything that they could be fat bastards if they needed to um there's things like um some sort of primate that they say has enter entered like the stone age like they've observed them using stones as like tools yeah it's like well that's pretty fucking crazy like can plant of the is plant of the apes possible um but using that same mental press mental thought and going towards like the christian faith and thinking of like the forbidden fruit and stuff that it's it might be describing the the time in human history when we started evolving i like killing specifically murdering other conscious beings for food and for war and for personal gain that that's like the forbidden fruit that caused us to be able to um activate levels of our brain and grow in our dna and our bio biology that other animals haven't because like what made humans special in the evolutionary process? Why was it us that got to skyscrapers and nuclear bombs and not dolphins? Well, first dolphins did, can't breathe. Like they, they haven't evolved to get out of the water. So they can only do what, like what they're like, they have to abide to the laws of physics just like humans do, but humans stand upright and breathe oxygen whereas dolphins swim and breathe oxygen but they can't live on land yeah uh that was a lot of stuff and i had certain things i'd like to say but i kind of i was listening and i kind of forgot them so hopefully i can like come up with them before we end this video but i think at least where you were talking about I want to say your remarks on like the Christianity and all that stuff. When I think of like Christianity and stuff like that, I like to think of, I don't know, cause it's definitely hard for me to like express how I feel about that, knowing like the tradition of Christianity and like knowing how people will respond to it just based off like what I've seen. But I like to believe that like, The biological naturalism is real that all Christianity is wrong because it believes that your soul will go on after you die and if biological naturalism is telling the truth then no you don't you die well, that's it and I think that has implications <laughs> very big implications on the real world because some people don't kill or don't steal and don't do bad things because they believe that in the next life they'll have to pay for it but <laughs> it seems that like at least what I've seen, people do bad things and they sure don't pay for it in this world. So if there's no afterlife, then they're, they're doing a bad things isn't necessarily bad because there's nobody to judge it. If you understand where I'm going with that. And I'm not advocating for people to go out and like start <laughs> rioting and pillaging and all that shit. But I think it's at least worth, at least worth like contemplating like, well, if, Christianity's wrong, and maybe I should be a little more selfish with my stuff because I'm not gonna receive the benefit I would receive from keeping it is not gonna equate to the benefit I would technically receive in an afterlife from not keeping it. You know what I mean? 
Go that ahead. in itself can get just broken down so deep. I hear you. I'm, yeah, I, I definitely hear you. Uh, but uh, another final thought I have on like Christianity is if I believe that if Christianity is true, then I don't believe that like heaven and like hell would be like places that we would be transported to when we die. I believe that they're states that we would live in while we're alive. And I can I can say I kind of can attest to where, where if I follow the beliefs of like charity and all this other shit, my life is definitely a lot better than it is when I'm not charitable and I'm like selfish and stingy. And I can see how you could can configure those things to be heaven and hell where maybe if I, maybe the benefit I receive in my current life, not my afterlife, but my current life from being charitable would be more than the benefit I would receive from not being charitable simply because of how we have to live in a society with others. But I oh man. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like this is a lot of stuff to put towards the end of the episode. It is. I'm sitting here just like, I'm like, I've got shit to, I've got shit to explode on off of this, Michael Kyle, but I can't. <laughs> I'm cool with that. This video can go on for as long as we need it to, honestly. Like, this is what I'm talking about. This is the phenomenological method, the way I see it, where like you can, we can talk about different ways of like explaining consciousness in the world. But once we get there, like the ramifications of those explanations, I feel they need to be discussed. And I'm willing to do that and I'm ready to. I, I think we've been doing this for a while now, though. I don't know when we started. I know this is going to definitely be a long video. So it would say, what does it mean to like make it a little longer? If you're willing to continue with those thoughts, we could also. I am just packing my stuff up to go inside, but I'm still talking about it. Oh, yeah. This is good shit. So my first thoughts I'm having like, well, like that quote, it goes to a couple questions. Like, well, do you believe in God or no? Do you believe in that or no? Um, but not just like belief, but the idea of like energy. Yeah. What are the laws of, of energy? It can't be like, it can't be created or destroyed, just transferred. So are, is like, since there is a specific amount of energy and you exist as a part of that energy and that energy collectively formulates what makes the biology of you, which is the, like fits the human genome, Uh, so when you were talking about energy, it made me think of, uh, I remember talking with you about hermeticism. I want to do a video on that, actually, because uh, it really does seem like the more and more I like exist and live through and like really pay attention to like all these things that they're talking about, the more I, uh, the more I see it happen. And it's a crazy, crazy phenomenon for me because like you can say, Oh, he has a bad energy. And we feel that like people can really like detect that from people. And it's, it's interesting, at least to say, like, I can detect en the energy of somebody else and like what their intentions are based off that energy. Um, I know it seems like you're walking somewhere right now. So I know it's probably a little weird for you to be talking. I Um. Let me see if I can find the. Uh, I just had to settle some things down. I'm getting ready to sit down again right now. Um, yeah, that, that's, I agree. And I hear you on all of the energy talks. And so it's like, well, where, like, if that energy belongs to you right now, does it ever cease belonging to you? And, and I, that, like, does that 